Dr. Dewell, obviously, I think the reason, and I have actually read this book, I can hand on heart say I, I made it in the last 12 hours after being very unwell. So if you can't understand me, it's because I'm still getting over the flu. Um, I think one of the reasons this is such an interesting book is that his engagement with Darfur is very long standing. And in fact, your doctoral thesis mm -hmm. was on the 1984 to 85 famine. Um, and this is actually an update and a revision of the book that first came out in 2005 at a time when, by your own admission, you say it was a, an optimistic time for Darfur. So um, you've updated it, you've revised it, you've taken into account the last few years. What path do you think Darfur is on now? It's very hard to tell, but I, I suspect that Darfur at the moment is, is in for more of the same. And let me explain what, I'm, what I mean by that, by, by, by contrasting um, where Darfur was at when we completed the first version of this, which, which is called a, a short history of, of a long war, and the current version. And we debated what to call it, because it's, this book is twice as long, and it was um, difficult to continue to call it a short history. And the war is obviously even longer. Um, so obviously one play, we played around with titles like a you know, less short history or a long history, but came with a, a new history. And I think the, um, the reason for that word new is not only are there a, a number of additional chapters reflecting what has happened in, in the last three years, but also we've gone back and, with the benefit of hindsight, reinterpreted quite a lot of the things that were going on uh, earlier, the, the origins of the war. Um, both Julie and I have, done, uh, have made trips to, to Sudan and Darfur and on, on, on the different sides of the lines. And, and talked to a, a number of the protagonists and, and, and got a lot more detail about what, what went on before. Now, I think the, um, the major difference between uh, three and a bit years ago, the, 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 the first edition was the actual writing was completed in about February of 2005. And, and today is, is, is the scale of the conflict. Um, when we were completing the, the first edition, uh, there was the beginnings of a lull in violence, but it didn't. But there was no certainty about what would happen. There was we were still really in 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 this shock of the period of of really large scale active hostilities of 2003 2004 up to January 2005, a period in which we don't know the, the full figures, but somewhere between 40 and 80 thousand people were killed. Probably 150 thousand people died of 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 hunger and and disease. And uh, it looked as though a, a very virulent Arab supremacism was motivating the uh, Darfur Arab, the, the Janjaweed militias, and that the campaign of ethnic cleansing with associated atrocity was set to continue. Um, that didn't actually happen. Um, what, what we've actually seen over the last um, three and a bit years, really since January of, of 2005, is a very different pattern. Uh, in that period, uh, the mortality rates in the areas reached by the aid agencies, that's mainly the camps, have returned to normal. I mean, they returned to normal by, by the middle of 2005. In the areas not reached, um, we, we have less good data, but we know what a famine looks like, and there has not been a famine in Darfur in that period. So uh, m nutrition rates are pretty poor, but it's not, it's, it's, not a, it's not a killing famine. The number of people killed by violence um, has been in the region of seven or 8,000. So it's, it's, it, uh, it's a sort of regular 100 or so people killed every month. Um, in a mixture of militia attacks, aerial bombardment, which kills, uh, it probably killed 100 people, actually, no more, uh, 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 over the last um, couple of years. Uh, rebel attacks, a lot of banditry, fighting between the militia themselves. And then occasional spikes going up to three or 400. There was one in January, particularly February of this year, when 150, perhaps 200 people were killed. There was a much bigger one. In, in, in August, September 2006, when as many as 1,000 people may have been killed. But that level of, 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 of mortality uh, by violence is, um, is actually a fairly normal occurrence for, for the peripheries of Sudan. It's not that different to what's happening in South Sudan, which is supposedly at peace. So why do we call Darfur at war, South Sudan at peace? I think what we 
Um, the best way of characterizing what's been happening in Darfur in the last three years is, is, is really the sort of violent politics of the frontier. And the, the, the war can be periodized. It really began in 1987 with the incursion of the Chadians. And, between, and for the following 15 or so years, uh, what we had was a, a, a breakdown in governance and a, a political marketplace in which the Sudan government was, was, was buying up um, groups, mainly tribal, militarized tribal groupings, giving them money, giving them arms, um, as a way of, of policing um, through a rather violent vigilantism this rather dangerous frontier. And in doing so, in, in provoking an, other groups into resistance and, and incipient rebellion. But it was only in end of 2002 into 2003 that that really sparked an all-out rebellion. And that was because of the, um, partly the, the cumulative effect of all these, the raiding and violence and this, um, and, and this divide and rule uh, warlordism of the frontier. Um, which is a, a very deeply historically rooted pattern going back to the 19th century. And partly because the SPLA got involved shipping a lot of arms in. And one of the, I think, the, the new elements in this book is, is, is we document a lot more the extent to which, even while the SPLA was talking peace with the Sudan government 2002, 2003, was also flying arms into Darfur. Um, the you have a, a, a very telling quote in the book where you say that the SPLA was treating the Darfur rebels as their younger brothers. Exactly, yeah. And, 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 and John Garing had a, had a strategy of, of having two tracks. He never put all his faith in the peace process. He was always keeping rebellion in reserve, including the rebellion in, 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 in Darfur. The Chadians got involved, um, and, and dissident Islamists. And that created the, 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 this horrific spike of insurgency and counterinsurgency 2003-2004. Uh, since then, we've been back to the old pack, uh, because the rebels have fragmented, the, the, the government militias have fragmented too. I mean, the idea that all the Arabs are proxies for the, the government is, is, is nonsense. Um, they, they're just as adept at manipulating the government as the government is adept at trying to manipulate them. In fact, not often they, they, they get the better of it. Uh, as you know from your trip to see Mohammed Hamdan Hemeti, I mean, this is, um, I'm sure many of you saw the film, Meet the Janjaweed. I'm, I'm amazed at uh, the amount of people who responded to that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, I mean, he's, he's flip-flopping, and, and yeah. there, is, there does seem to be a trend within the Arab yeah. militias to, to appreciate that loyalty has a very high price at the moment. Exactly. And, I, and, and I think what that word high price is very instrumental, because what we see is, is a political marketplace. Um, in which the, the chief instrument of, of the the Sudan government and the other bidders in this auction of loyalties, the Libyans, the Chadians, the SPLA, and the international community, are, are really trying to buy up the loyalty of, of, of certain groups. And some of them have acronyms like SLA, so-and-so attached to them. Others have tribal names. Forget whether they're Arab or non-Arab or SLA or, or whatever. The only group actually fighting the government is GEM, and we can come back to that point. But the great majority of, 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 of them are really vying for uh, a place in the sun, if you like, or uh, being a conduit, a recipient of patronage, of money. And because they're more buyers in the game than they were before, especially the Libyans and the Chadians, who are um, very well financed, the Chad and with all the attention to the Sudan's oil industry, we have overlooked the fact that um, every, every penny that is, that is paid to ExxonMobil is going to finance the, 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 the war on the other side, because ExxonMobil is financing the Chad government. Um, somehow has not sort of broken the surface of popular consciousness. Um, and, and that's bidding up the price of loyalty. And when the price of loyalty is high and the frontier is difficult, difficult to control, more guns flow in and, 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 the, and the situation becomes more violent. And I think the case of, of Hameti is very instructive in, the, in that. This was an, an, an Arab militia commander, a Janjaweed, who in October of last year received a vast, huge shipment of, of weaponry and money and, and vehicles from the Sudan government to fight the rebels. What did he do? He defected. He decamped to the other side. He sent his emissaries to talk to the Libyans, the Chadians, the SPLA, the international community. They all rejected him because being a Darfur Arab is such a stigmatizing label. No one wants to deal with you. 
Um, so he he had no. What he would have liked to have done was was was, was equivocated. Would have played what the was historically in, in in Darfur known as the game of tajility, which is from the Arabic tajil, meaning to delay, where you just you you hold yourself apart from all these faraway patrons until you see which one will give you the best price, and even then you don't fully enter into an agreement. Um, in the case of Hemeti, because there were no other buyers, he had to go back to Khartoum. Uh, he got a very mu much better deal, um, much more favorable to his terms. Um, so he's much less a proxy. It's not quite clear who's manipulating who in, in, in that relationship, I would say. But I, mean, I think what's also interesting is that it's not just the Libyans, the China, you know, it's not just the regional governments that are involved in this marketplace of loyalty. It, it's also the international community. It's also the UN, the African Union. It might not be hard cash, but as you touch upon in your book, there, there are deals within deals, especially, I mean, you talk a lot about the first peace treaty in Abuja and why you think that that was not sustainable. Yeah, I think um, it, it was very interesting to, to be part of that, 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 that peace process, which clearly didn't succeed. And the, and the main criticism that's been made of it is it didn't meet the legitimate demands of the, of the Darfurian rebels. Um, I'm actually rather more cynical about it, and it was, um, let me explain how I think it worked, because if, if, if you looked at the, the actual f formal format, it was a, a square table. The main room was a square table, and you had the, um, if, I, if I'm the chief mediator at the head of the table, as it were, the Sudan government delegation is on this side, the rebels on this side, the international community making up the, the final part of the square. And to all intents and purposes, it looks like a formal interstate negotiation in which two equal parties are, are there. And the, uh, the chief negotiator on, on the government side was a, a physician, a man called Dr. Majzoub al-Khalifa, who, who would sit there smiling in a faintly reptilian way while insults were hurled at him. And he just, he would just, and, and, and um, he, he, I, I, he developed a particularly thick skin, and, 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 and I speculated the fact that, he, that his training was as a dermatologist at giving him this, <laughs> this, this particular... Um, this particular skill, um, and then he would any suggestion he would just say impossible, not possible at all, at all, and it was clear that that was that was a game. And um, my, my approach was to was to completely disregard that and and really explore what I anticipated would be their real interests. But um, Magzoub's game was not to, to engage in these substantive talks. Magzoub's game was on the side to try and calculate the price, the cash price of every single delegate in the hotel, um, which included the, the, uh, the rebels, his own side as well, because he didn't trust them, um, and also certain members of the international community and, and, and the mediation, and try and, and buy them up. And it was interesting when we got to the very final days. Um, but his colleagues call it retail politics, the politics of the souk. And uh, when we got to the final days, actually the, the, the wisdom of, of Magzoub's approach was revealed by the fact that the core issues that the three rebel leaders wanted to negotiate on was cash. Uh, Abdul Wahid was offered a $30 million compensation fund. He wanted more than $100 million under his control to dispense. So it was really patronage. The issue was patrimonialism. And the question was, you know, would the resources coming from the center be enough to endow the, the key rebel leaders who were there with enough funds to disperse to their own followers to buy up enough loyalty for them to become you know, significant political players? Mini Minawi was also interested in cash, not so much in compensation, but in, in salaries and so on. And, and Khalil, too, in salaries for his, his, his troops and, and, and certain commercial deals. And I think, in retrospect, actually, the, the, the main error made by the mediation wasn't the question of, of, of issues of justice. It was, the, it was the fact that we were not brutally cynical enough to say, to follow Majzoub's lead and say, what is the real price of these, these guys? How much are they actually asking for? You talk about the, the main areas of the, of the mediation team, and, and in the book you have a, another fantastic quote um, from a, a UN advisor saying that getting a sensible view heard is like uh, shouting in the middle of a crowd, that basically there are too many voices in the Darfur situation for, for people to be able to move forward and resolve it. Mm -hmm. How much do you think the, the wealth of, of concern and international opinion on Darfur has been squandered, and how much do you think that it 
in itself became a hindrance to resolving the situation in Darfur. I think it, it, it's very interesting to, to look back with the benefit of hindsight at what was achieved when. Because if, if, if we look at the data for, for killings, and the data are pretty good. I mean, we don't know how many people died 2003, 2004, but we know that was when the killings were. We, from middle of 2004, we have very, very good records. And something like 80 to 85% of the, the killing was, bef um, was before April 2004. Um, another 6, 7, 8%, the rest of 2004, and about 6 or 7% since then. Um, and, and, and so the, the, the great majority of the killing, I mean, if, if one is to call it genocidal killing or massacre or war crimes, was uh, 2003. And actually, the, the ceasefire that was signed in, in, in Jemena, in the Chadian capital, on the 8th of April 2004, was actually the end of the major killing. And the, the following couple of months was when the humanitarian operation was stood up. Now, that was achieved without, with scarcely any international attention to Darfur. The international attention came on the 10th anniversary of, of, of the Rwanda genocide, which was the beginning of April 2004. So, and it was precisely at that moment, actually, that the, the majority of the killings came to an end and, and the humanitarian operation was, was stood up. And that was, that was achieved primarily because the Sudan government had, had, had got what it wanted, which is it had basically defeated the rebels. And secondly, uh, because of the, the fairly low-key efforts of, of, of professional diplomats, including especially the Americans, also the Brits and, 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 and some others. Um, and the... So the, cam the international campaign, which then got underway, was, as it were, too late. It was after the event. It had all happened. And the, the, the AU troops came in and were actually quite effective in, that, in, in, in their early months. And when Colin Powell spoke about uh, genocide on this, in September of 2004, um, he said, in, in the opinion of the State Department, based on the interviews that it had conducted, which, of course, referred to the period the, the previous period, genocide has been committed and may be continuing. And that word may carries a lot, because uh, a, a lot of weight, because the, the evidence that he, that he was being given was that actually it wasn't continuing, it had stopped. But there was a, an element of uncertainty there. And, but the, this, this campaign that has insisted that genocide is, is ongoing at a time when um, 100 people are being killed every month, which is, statistically speaking, a, a death rate that is no different to that in Washington, D.C. Um, the homicide rate there is about 35 per 100,000 per year. In Darfur, at the moment, it's about 36 per 100,000 per year. Um, so it's, Darfur is not about killing. Um, there is you know, this, this horrible mass displacement that occurred 2003, 2004 that hasn't been put right. Um, this, this accelerated very traumatic transition, this sort of forced urbanization that's gone on, the emptying of vast areas of land, etc., the militarization of society. These are all the things that have happened. Killing is really very much a minor issue in, 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 in Darfur these days. But that's not the way that it has been portrayed. And the, the insistence on international forces, whether it be the UN or NATO, as the preferred solution, to me, is just nonsensical. And uh, it, I was skeptic as to what inter international can, intervention can do at the best of times. I think the, um, if there was a time for sending a tough peacekeeping mission, it was 2003, 2004. <laughs> What's needed now is, is, is a much lighter footprint operation, which um, is, 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 is based on negotiating uh, relations with communities, um, because this is a, a multi-pronged war. And frankly, the, um, most of the troops who are there don't know what's going on. You know, they um, they don't know who, who who who's fighting whom. And it's only the the civil and political affairs officers of of, of the UN mission who are who, who are really properly informed. And those are the people who can do something. And they're entirely marginal to the operation. We're basically spending two billion dollars on a red herring. Um, but do people want to hear that? I mean, you've, you're based uh, in the states. The 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 perception and the campaign in the states is is much stronger than it is here about Darfur as being a very black and white, cowboys and Indians kind of conflict. People don't want to hear that. And, and, and one, of the, one of the things that's, that um, is 
quite persistent and I think quite, quite dangerous is the fact that I mean, if one takes the last eight, nine months, there's a very consistent pattern, which is that GEM, the justice and equality movement, goes on the offensive. It goes on the offensive either in West Darfur, as it did at the beginning of this year, in Southeast Darfur, as in the middle of last year, Kordofan, as just over a year ago, um, Kordofan and Omdurman, as last week. Everyone is silent about it. Then the government comes in with reprisals, and it overreacts. It bombs, it kills you know, 50, 100, 150 people. And all the, the campaign comes down on the government for responding. Now, we know the Sudan government is a beast. We know that this is, this is a monster that when, when it mounts military campaigns, civilians will get killed in large numbers. And although the numbers are much down on what they were four years ago, you know, there is going to be significant killing. And yet those who, who prod and provoke and bait this beast, i.e. the justice and equality movement, escape with complete impunity. And it is, I think, therefore unsurprising that they've been gradually escalating um, their attacks, even up to... Actually, up, up, you mentioned in the book that the justice and equality movement, in your opinion, is the only rebel group that Khartoum, that Umar al-Bashir specifically, is genuinely afraid of. Um, it, it's the only group that's really fighting the government. The others are, 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 are playing this game of, of, of frontier politics. Um, Jem is, 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 is scary to the government because it has its internal links. It's fighting for Khartoum and Jemaine. It's not fighting for Darfur. Darfur just happens to be in the way. Um, uh, it, it, Khalil has his, his, his eyes on the prize, on, on, on over, overthrowing Bashir. As we saw when they reached Umdurman a few weeks ago. Precisely. And, and, and he has links with the, the, with the Islamists, with groups within, um, within Khartoum. And he has the backing of, of, of Chad. And Chad is, is, is an oil state, well-funded. The Libyans also are, are backing him. We don't quite know, I quite know why or to what extent. And therefore, he, 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 is, he, he is. And also, Khalil has organization. I mean, he's a, he, he, he's a very disciplined, effective organizer, unlike the others who are, who are, who are frankly, incompetent when it comes to organizing anything. Um, so. Khalil is, 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 is certainly someone to be very concerned about um, if, 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 you are, if you are Bashir. So if, sorry, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that there are probably a lot of questions, um, so I'm not going to monopolize you, and this is my last question. But if you were to look into the future, you talk about the Arabs, the necessity for the inclusion of the Arabs, the necessity to view the Arabs in Darfur as not necessarily being represented by the government and not necessarily the bogeyman, and that without their inclusion, there is no future for peace. Is this, if you were in charge of, uh, of making it all OK, is this where you would want policy to be focused? I think what, I mean, what's encouraging about, uh, about what's happening in Darfur is that on the ground, there's a lot of local peace. I mean, Hermeti, when he uh, when he jumped ship in, in 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 October, made a deal with the the four of Jabal Mara, and that deal still stands. Even though he's now gone back to the government, he's not violating that deal. And basically, there's really no war to speak of between four and Arab. The Zagawa is a different issue. Most of North Darfur has been at peace. Um, the areas are mostly controlled by SLA unity, uh, but there is. There is tension between the Zagawa and, 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 and the Arabs, and I would expect in, in, in the coming weeks, in the aftermath of the Jem attack, the government will go on the offensive, and, 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 and that stability that has existed for the last couple of years will, will go. Um, my guess is that this, um, this, this sort of state of affairs in, in between war and peace, the sort of politics of, of the violent politics of the frontier with groups jostling for, um, for position, will continue. And if I were in, 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 in the position of the mediation, I would, I, I, I would dispense completely with trying to deal with the rebel leadership. I and mean, the rebel leadership, frankly, taking the international mediation for a ride. There's this, uh, this term, tagility. You know, delaying, procrastinating, forestalling, doing everything you can not to put your name on a piece of paper that is a final agreement. And the, the rebel leaders, especially Abdul Wahid, are masters of this. Um, just as their predecessors were when the term was coined at the beginning of, of the last century. Um, and um, 
the reason why they engage with Jan Larsen, who's I think he's in town today, um, or certainly he's in town tomorrow, the reason why they're engaging with him is not because they want to make peace with Khartoum, it's precisely because they don't want to make peace with Khartoum. They want an alibi for being where they are, which is at the moment quite comfortable. They would, they're holding on in the hope that there's uh, democratic administration in Washington that, 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 that sends NATO troops or bombs Khartoum or does something like that. Um, I, I, w I would try and rule out these, these options, these, the, these dramatic options. I would try and stop the, prevent the, the proxy war between Sudan and Chad from getting out of control, which it is in serious danger of doing so. And then I think one can actually begin a sort of to, to construct a social peace within, um, within Darfur. Well, I think you've painted a very different mm -hmm. picture from one we're used to seeing, so I'm sure that there are going to be lots of questions. Um, just before I take your question, sir, um, can I just ask you please to stick to questions and not statements? My experience generally when it comes to Delphi is that we get a lot of statements. So um, yes, if you could uh, tell us your name and your question. Yes, my name is Paul DeRoy. I'm just uh, an interested person. Um, I have two related questions. You know, one is um, when uh, Donald Rumsfeld came to power in, in Pentagon, he stated that he wanted to take out seven countries, and uh, from Wesley Clark, we know that Sudan was one of them. So I would like you, to, uh, since you have explained the situation in Sudan basically in, from endogenous forces, uh, you know, I was, I was wondering if you could address the issue of, you know, what other forces are doing in the area, and given that the French and the Americans have military bases and whatnot in Chad. So if, if you could address that, I would appreciate it. And the second element is where Darfur becomes propaganda and uh, you know Colin Powell referring to genocide is quite, a, quite nonsense in the sense that you know Americans are perpetrating genocide in Iraq so uh, the element that is curious to me is that you have uh, Zionist groups in the United States many of them uh, organizing around the Darfur and you know they're taking this to uh, divestment campaigns and whatnot, and uh, it, it is actually very disingenuous what they're doing, or it is awful what they're doing, is it, they're trying to protect Israel by doing these silly campaigns, you know, uh, to crowd out the Palestinian solidarity in the, in the United States, and also to, you know, claim that, you know, there are worse baddies in the world than, than Israel. So that's where they come from, but I would like you to address that issue of, you know, what the Zionist groups in the United States are doing. Are doing with reference. I, I'm I'm worried we slightly veered into into statements as opposed to questions with that one. But um, are doing with regards to Darfur. I mean, when you say Zionist groups, you're talking about the well, Jewish the networks, panoply. or so. There's a whole panoply of uh, Zionist groups. Uh, they may have some umbrella groups in Sudan, Sudan divestment and whatnot, and they run uh, campaigns in uh, universities tr uh, trying to push uh, the divestment of um, uh, from. Uh, uh, from uh, Sudan, uh, but uh, it comes at a time when uh, you know people were gearing up to do the same thing for uh, you know divesting from Israel. So it was it is viewed as a cynical ploy to cry. So, so your question one. is: Is that a cynical ploy? Well, yeah, let's say I would like to have a, a, I would like yeah. you to address that issue. Okay, okay, okay. Alex. Um, let me start with with Rumsfeld. I mean, when the Bush administration came came was elected, to the extent it was elected, um, uh, came into office. And in, 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 in 2001, it launched a review of the Sudan policy because the previous administration, Clinton too, had a regime change policy in Sudan, which hadn't worked. And, uh, and out of sheer real politique, the, the Bush administration said, you know, it's, it's we know that regime change by proxy using SPLA is not going to work. It's, it's, the SPLA just is not going to deliver on that. What are the chances of, of a peace process? And they debated and they thought the chance is somewhere between 5 and 10 percent. That was the, in, in, in the first six months of the Bush administration, that was the consensus amongst diplomats here in London, in Norway, and in, in Washington. So they said, OK, well, we'll give it a try, but we won't invest a great deal of effort in it. And, uh, after, and, and, and the special envoy was appointed beginning of September, just before September the 11th. September the 11th gave a fillet to the process that was already underway. And so 
if, if, if Rumsfeld was, was saying that, you know, at the beginning that Sudan was on a target list of countries, it didn't stay there very long. And, and the, the, during the first Bush administration, the policy was actually a, a pretty sound one. It was to get peace between North and South. And, and it, that was something that m most observers thought was a remote possibility. And the fact that it was achieved was quite remarkable. And, and the, the, um, the US um, was ready to herald that as its major foreign policy success in the Arab world. It also helped that the uh, Sudanese intelligence was cooperating on, on, on counterterrorism, because having hosted Al Qaeda a few years ago, it, was, it had the files and could, and, and, and could hand them over. And the Darfur policy that followed on from that into the beginning of the second administration was continuing to support the comprehensive peace agreement, the North-South agreement. And, and it was, it, 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 meanwhile, there were lo a lot of voices in the administration that, that wanted to go back to a more regime change policy because th there was you know, no love lost with Khartoum. And, and, and what was driving the, the peace policy was you know, rail politique, um, just because what, simply what they thought was achievable rather than, than, than ideology. So it was really an, it was an exception to the unilateralism of, of Bush, because it was a very much a multi, it was an ad hoc multilateral initiative um, with, without a threat of force involved. And it succeeded. And I think there are clear lessons from that. However, the wrong lessons subsequently were learned, um, which was that only threats of force and unilateral actions will, um, will prevail, which is why one of the reasons why I think things have, have, have gone badly wrong in, in the last couple of years with a lot of table thumping and saber rattling over, over troops and so on. So what are the US interests? The US interests are, 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 are pretty mixed. Um, and I think at the moment, the US is veering back towards its earlier policy of let's try and get this one wrapped up. We can't, uh, Khartoum is not going to be dislodged. Um, and if it were to be dislodged, what would follow would be worse. Um, let's, let, 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 let's try and make a deal and, 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 and see if we can push this through and, and you know, pay lip service to the, the, uh, the Greek chorus. Um, France has uh, interest in Chad. And France was, I mean, it, it, it had its military base there and was trying to disengage. And, and, and it's, it, it, it's um, and Chief interest in Chad as of a year ago was 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 really um, number one that um, Idris Deby had put in power President Bozizé in Central African Republic and there there was a serious US, um, serious French military base and so Deby was was a friend and 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 secondly if Deby went they feared for the worst Deby was the least bad option and Deby played his weakness extremely smartly he repeatedly called the bluff of the French. Um, to the extent that when he was attacked and was uh, in February, was in his palace, the French said, "We can evacuate you," and he said, "No, I'd rather die here." And in doing and, and in calling their bluff, he then brought in the French as his ally, and they've still and they've been trying to talk him back a bit from some of his confrontational policy with um, with his domestic adversaries and with Sudan, with limited success. Um, but, Fr but France and indeed the European Union, as a result, has found itself in the position of a non-impartial military force in Chad, um, more by accident and stupidity than by design. Because it, in, in, it, it is, if you like, the logical consequence of sending peacekeeping troops into a country where there is no peace, where you only make an agreement with one side, i.e. the government. And, and you can't maintain your impartiality under those circumstances, and, which is what the French have found. And the Irish and others will find, too. So. Um, the French position is, 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 is a rather awkward and embarrassing one, but they, they're also very keen to, um, to present it in the best possible light, um, and which, which will mean that they're very partisan. Um, and, and then the, the, the campaign. Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure that I, I, I subscribe to the conspiracy theories of why the Save Darfur campaign is, is, is so is so relentless. I think it's much more to do um, with the, the accidents of timing. Um, I think it's not an accident that the, the, the people that it's targeting happen to be Arabs. I think that's very convenient. I mean, Arabs don't tend to have friends in, 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 in the US these days. Um, 
but the uh, uh, I think the the um, the campaign just generated its own momentum, and it and it's become self-sustaining, and 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 it, and it's convenient. But I but 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 I don't see the same level of of, of, of conspiracy as being as, as being there. Um. Theo Bell, I'm also just an interested person. Um, many of the books in the Africa Work series talk about patrimonialism. If during the negotiations that you mentioned, if had there been the 100 to 200 million available, would it have changed anything? And secondly, if you look at the Second World War um, in Europe, they, there were just so many people killed, so many people died for whatever. But in the end, Europe reached the point where they said, enough is enough, and we've got to reach a, a point where we resolve conflicts in a slightly different manner. Will parts of Africa, or Africa as a whole, um, ever reach a point where they say, well, OK, there may be other ways of, of doing this, or is the, the level of instability such that um, they will always be the plaything of the Exxon Mobiles, or mobiles of this world, um, to continue a simmering conflict to engage in something that is nothing to do with the people of Africa or the states of Africa, but basically about other issues which which don't get discussed when you talk about the kind of things that you've been talking about so far. That's a big question. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, oh my god. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, there's an interesting recent book by Robert Bates called um, When Things Fell Apart, which basically uh, makes the argument based on, on, on a really a, a, a pretty impressive mass of statistics that a lot of the, the conflicts and, and the state crises in Africa that we see today came about because of the squeeze on fiscal resources of the state that happened in the 80s and 90s. And just that squeeze meant that it, it simply wasn't possible for patronage systems to be inclusive. They, they, they couldn't buy up enough people within their countries, enough elites, to be stable. And, uh, and, and as a result, uh, governments turned from the inclusive patrimonialism and the provision of services towards policies policies based on depredation on 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 financing local militia to to um, asset strip basically and indeed um, uh, licensing members of the elite to to either rake off huge amounts of of, of of resources in forms of rent from aid or so on or get into asset stripping themselves and I think there's a lot of a lot of truth in this, especially for for, um, for Sudan, and well, Chad never really reached the stage where it, where it could actually deliver any form of uh, of services, but it looked like it might be beginning to. Um, and and I think restoring that degree of 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 um, fiscal solvency and inclusiveness um, within the patrimonial systems, which aren't going to be reformed anytime soon, I think is is. Is pretty essential to um, resolving these protracted violent crises. That could suggest that the outside world will continue to pay this debt. If you don't, mm. if you don't include the criminalization of Africa book into all this, mm. and think of Angola, where the, the oil wealth doesn't even get accounted for uh, within Angola, and the, the money that Senegal makes. Um, goes to banks in Switzerland or, or the US and doesn't even come on shore, um, then I, I, I can't see a way of, of ever resolving this un unless there's a massive outside threat like Europe faced from the Soviet Union and then came to an, a, a different way of resolving differences within Europe. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm just going to jump in. I'm just going to have to jump in there because I know lots of people have Darfur specific questions. Uh, lady at the back with the glasses. Thank you. Um, my name is Alice Klein. I was just wondering, um, China's been in the news a lot recently. I'm thinking more about the reputation in Tibet than the unfortunate earthquake. Um, it, is, the, is China still operating with regard to 
extracting natural resources in Sudan? And if so, this is for both of you, by the way. Um, and if so, is that affecting the situation in Darfur at all still? I mean, somebody referenced the disinvestment campaigns in the States, and I know some of them were for Chinese companies. Um, the, the key role that China played was 10 years ago, when Sudan was bankrupt and on the point of, 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 of really being completely, the government of being really completely unsustainable and, 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 and imploding. And it, the government gambled on being able to build a pipeline and export and drill oil wells where it knew there was oil and export it. And it pulled it off. I mean, it was quite an extraordinary feat of um, military engineering. And it pulled it off with Chinese support. And, um, and that history hasn't really been written. Uh, uh, and the the cost of that in terms of human life in the oil producing areas of Upper Nile was immense. Those areas were just completely cleared. And whatever happened in Darfur, I mean, what happened in Upper Nile ten years ago was was, was considerably worse. Very very little documented. And, and and really that that was China's contribution. Now, China is still a, a major oil importer, though I think it's number three out of Sudan's. Um, uh, I think Japan is number one in terms of buying Sudanese oil. I think it's either India or Malaysia that's number two. Anyway, um, China, China is up there. It's, it's one of the biggest suppliers of arms along with I Iran is number one. I think China beats Ukraine as number two. Uh, you know, but it, it, you know, it, 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 the idea that China is, is providing the economic lifeline for Sudan today ain't so. Um, it, it, its key role has been in the uh, UN Security Council, where it has, it, it has blocked and slowed down and watered down many, many resolutions. However, it has also intervened um, uh, to, it was a Chinese proposal that brought about the UN-AU hybrid force in, 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 in Darfur. Um, it, uh, Chinese weapons have been used in, in in Darfur, but the Sudan government would buy weapons um, anywhere on the market. The Chinese do have a, um, um, have you know, humanitarian operations. For example, when uh, there was a, a bombing raid about just over two weeks ago in a town in North Darfur, and 12 people were killed and half a dozen people badly injured, including some children. It was the Chinese that actually offered to, to provide them with, with medical care. I mean, it was an interesting incident. It was the worst. Uh, the worst bombing incident with civilian fatalities in, in Sudan for since January 2000, so for, for eight years, um, with, with 12 people killed. And uh, interestingly enough, it was the ICRC and the Chinese who, who responded. Um, uh, and I think the, the, uh, the Chinese role at the Security Council has, 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 has really been the key one. But I, I, I would argue that all the Security Council debates over troops and so on are really a distraction from the key issue. So I wouldn't, I'm, I'm, I'm not of the opinion that China is, 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 is as big a player as it has been made out to be. Um, yes. Um, hi, my name's Anna Goodman. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the displacement, particularly the enforced urbanisation, because you mentioned that in passing. I think that I'd heard a lot about people living in refugee camps, but not so much about the urbanisation, so in terms of where people are living and what it's meaning for how they're living. Right. I think this is, this is a really interesting question. Um, Darfur, five years ago, was 18% urbanised. Um, about you know, one in six Darfurians lived in, 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 in the four major towns. Today, the population is about one-third urban, one-third rural, one-third displaced. Now, when we talk about internally displaced people, we're actually talking about urban migrants. We, the only reason why we call them IDPs is because we like to give them aid, and we want to pretend that this is a, this is a temporary situation. In fact, if you go to these IDP camps, they're really integrated into the towns economically increasingly so. And even if there's peace tomorrow, I would be surprised if as many as a third of those IDPs were to go home. Um, so Darfur, let's say there is peace. Um, and and, 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 and we ca um, Darfur is now more than 50% urbanized, permanently urbanized. So the, the main sociological impact of this war has been 
massive accelerated and traumatic urbanization, which has all sorts of implications um, in terms of the social structure, the, the rise of a new political leadership, in terms of education. The education facilities are much better in the towns and the IDP camps than they ever were um, in, in, in the villages, and where there was really no education at all. So even the very modest things that are, be, are being set up in the IDP camps are an improvement. And that proximity to towns means that the displaced will be getting a better education. And we also see it in Khartoum. I mean, Khartoum was a, a city of 250,000 50 years ago. It's now between 7 and 8 million. That's a 30-fold increase. And the city is just vast. I mean, it's just enormous. And the whole of Sudan is represented there. And I think the, um, what, we will, what we will see in, in, in the coming years is I mean, the future of Sudan has always been decided in, in the city. And the, we, we don't, we're not really seeing full social integration. There's a lot of racial discrimination, et cetera, et cetera, in the city. But there's also a social peace. It's a, it's a remarkably safe city. And um, there are opportunities for you know, upward mobility and, and, and integration and education of those who, who, who are living there. And I think the, 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 the social transformation brought about by urbanization is actually going to change the political landscape of, 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 of Sudan. And if, if you like, it's, the, uh, it's the, the main unanticipated consequence of the government's ravaging of its peripheries is the significance of the town, which, which is not what they wanted. They didn't want the city transformed in this way. But it, it will change the character of, of, of Sudan. And I think the elections of, of next year will be the, um, the key test of that. I, th I, I do think it's a really interesting question also in terms of you speak a lot about the, the lack of capacity, political capacity that the rebels have. And with this integration into the urban areas, do you think that the government has unwittingly created a savvier future rebellion, has created new children for the revolution? I really don't know. I mean, they're, 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 the, the, the first time you said this, the, I'm quite happy the, to hear that. Um, there's, there's a, I mean, there is a worry, and the government is very worried about urban insurrection. It's, it, it's a thing that most worries it. And, and it, um, as you know, 10, 15 years ago, it comprehensively replanned Khartoum, you know, in an apartheid style, demolished a lot of the squatter settlements, and set them up in such a way that they can be easily segregated and policed and, and, and banned and, and IDPs so on. settling in Khartoum exactly, from Exactly, you know, and. Mm -hmm. and you know, the, the outskirts of Khartoum are laid out in Napoleon III style, you know, with straight boulevards, you can fire your tanks down, etc. Um, and, you know, a lot of security attention, a lot of money is going into co-opting the, the leaders of these squatter settlements and trying to turn them into businessmen with some success. Um, because then, you know, and, and, and quite often in these IDP camps, you see a very vibrant commercial center with, you know, a lot of uh, activities going on, uh, um, a lot of stolen cars go there, etc. And, um, and uh, so there is a, uh, you know, there is a lot of consciousness in among the IDPs and the squatters about their social and economic and political situation and and if you like revolutionary feeling. But it's 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 always being submerged in the struggle for survival and the co-option of the leadership. So I think it's, it's, it's more likely that it will, it will mutate into more civic forms of political activism. And the, um, the SPLM, if, it, if it's able to mobilize these constituencies for the election of next year, could actually surprise everyone by winning a vast number of seats. I think the SPLM made a major strategic miscalculation in when it, asked, when it insisted on the southerners around Khartoum, who numbered several million to be uh, disenfranchised in the north and, and repatriated to the south. I think if it, if it had said, keep these guys in the north, let them vote there, then it would have uh, you know, found itself in, in, in a much politically, in much stronger political position come the election. Um, I'm going to take one from here, and then uh, the gentleman over there. I'm Doug Abel here with Media Watch. Um, I just have a brief question about death toll figures. Um, John Holmes of the UN recently updated to about 300,000, uh, whereas it had been hovering around 200,000 for um, a few years prior to that. Um, and as you were saying, the 
figures are probably um, a bit less than this. Um, do you think seemingly arbitrary actions such as this um, serve to increase the size of the stick with which the Sunnis government uh, gets hit? Um, and as such, places sort of larger obstacles in the way of a negotiated settlement. Um, it was interesting when, um, when John Holmes was asked why, why he'd upped the figure, he said, well, we stopped counting a few years ago. In fact, th the reason why the figure hadn't gone up was that we'd started counting and, and people weren't dying. So the figure wasn't going up. Um, uh, I mean, I think the fig figure is probably higher than 200,000, but I, th I think it was, it was a purely arbitrary um, statistic that pulled out of the air. And, and, and I think the, it, these sorts of figures just do no credit to anybody. And um, the other point I would make is, is, is that the debate on the figures has been a bit odd. I mean, uh, a year ago when I um, are discussed with some, um, some of the activists and said, look, I, I personally prefer to use the lower figures. The, and, and some of the activists were saying, no, it's 400,000. The implication was really that if you say, if it, those people like me who say 200,000 are somehow saying it's all right. You know, is it all right to kill 200,000? You know, it's, it's 200,000 is a lot of people. Um, and the gentleman. Yeah. Should we take groups of a yeah, couple of questions? I think and otherwise, I we may. How, how long have we got, Deborah? OK, all right. So if we take this gentleman here, and then there's a gentleman with glasses. Two gentlemen with glasses over there. Um. I was wondering if you thought the UN and aid agencies treat them separately. Were there still a major presence in them? Are they useful presence? That's a good one. I was just intrigued by your uh, passing reference to ExxonMobil, so I was wondering if you could <coughs> talk about that a bit more. In um, 1981, 1881, I was living in Zalinji, Darfur, and I was witness to demonstrations against the Khartoum government because they'd appointed a leader uh, from of Darfur that governor of Darfur, mm. outside of Darfur, from Kordofan. And it was very successful demonstrations, and they actually overturned the decision and got uh, Dereg uh, appointed as governor. And that was sort of relating to the question about urbanization. Although they were small, but it was, I mean, Zalinji, you know, you had a big demonstration, all the school students, etc. the market was closed down for the day, the... Uh, the police uh, tried to throw uh, tear gas, but they were that old that the tear gas didn't explode. You know, it was, there were a, a handful of police in the town, etc. Very different to the whole situation now. But even in El Fasha, the biggest town, where there were three, three killed, and you saw the army refusing to turn on the demonstrators because the army was mainly from Darfur and could not be relied on. But it, it makes me wonder because it seems to me the city and the towns have not really played a role in the war in Darfur. And yet you look to Khartoum, and there are probably as many Darfuris living in Khartoum as almost there are in Darfur. And I imagine that was what the point of Halil was in, from, from Jem in terms of attacking. Cartoon. Although, I mean, I think it's naive to think that by attacking Khartoum you'll get that uh, you'll line up the touch pad of rebellion. But, I mean, I, mean, I suppose the question there is what, I mean, it sounds not that, that great, but what are the prospects of sort of genuine uh, dissent from the masses actually yeah. coming through? Yeah. And also, in terms, just in terms of you talk about the local peace that exists. Does that mean to the extent that some of the villages are returning to normality and is there still, is the um, trade between nomads and, and villagers starting to, to re-emerge? Yeah. Okay. 
Let that me take one. that one first. Shall we, um, do you, you want to take that one first and not start? I, I, I'll, I'll answer all three. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll just take do them in way. reverse order if it's okay. That's okay. Um, a lot of markets are reopening. And in fact, it, the, the market is the basis for reconciliation. That's where it happens. Um, and b because the, the Arabs, the, the pastoralists and the farmers need, need, need to trade. Um, the point you make about the, 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 the Sudanese tradition of the, the urban intifada is, 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 I think, very important. Because actually, the, the, the very first war in Darfur, 1987, 1988, was also um, a, a demonstrations of Darfurians in Khartoum were absolutely instrumental in getting the then government of Sadiq al-Mahdi to say, OK, we're going to have to take this seriously. And, it, and it's a very interesting question why this hasn't, why this hasn't happened. Um, I think one reason why, why it didn't happen was the people who might have led it in the 1990s, because of the level of repression of the Islamist regime, went into armed opposition. Um, and I th but I think what we're beginning to see is, is the mobilization of an, uh, of an alternative leadership in the camps and in the towns. And it's interesting, one of the, the reasons I, th I strongly suspect why so many of these people profess loyalty to Abdul Wahid is not because they expect him to return. It's because they don't expect him to return. It's a, it, it, it buys them time. Um, if, it, you know, if you're loyal to, you know, to, certain, to, to, to this figure who's outside, who's becoming a bit mythical, who actually exercises no control at, at all, never appoints anyone, never makes a decision, then, um, then you, you can postpone a lot of your tough leadership decisions while you get organized at a local level. And I think that's, um, that's one of the things that, that, that's happening. Um, and we may, and it'll be interesting to see how, how that plays out and whether it's uh, violent or, 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 or nonviolent. Um, ExxonMobil, um, Chad, Chad has substantial oil and, and began to export it in nine, about the same time as Sudan, I think, 1999. And, a year uh, after Sudan. Mm. A year after okay. Sudan. And it's, it, it, it's, it's, the pipeline goes through Cameroon. And the construction of the pipeline was um, done with a very complex agreement, including the World Bank and Citibank and ExxonMobil, whereby a large part of the revenue would be put in a special fund. Uh, there was a revenue management program so that it would go for development and schools and all the rest of it. Um, this worked for a little while, in fact, was one of the reasons that helped. It really gave a boost to Chadian civil society and democratization. At the moment, Idris Deby was under military threat beginning of 2006, I believe. He just tore it up and just pocketed the money. And since then, you know, the um, ExxonMobil, which is by far the biggest um, oil extractor, has been paying its, its commercially agreed you know, um, contribution to, to the Chadian exchequer. And while civil servants go unpaid, while schools go unbuilt, the Chadian government's been importing arms, and one of its main instruments, both for internal control and for destabilization, is the justice and equality movement. And um, Jem has been on the offensive. Um, personally, I would uh, not want to draw any sharp moral distinction between Jem and the Sudan government. Um, I, a number of the members of Jem I personally like, but I think that they are responsible for a lot of what's happening. And, and it seems to me uh, I, an important, a significant double standard that there isn't any attention to the role of, of Chadian oil in fueling Darfurian war, indeed, attacks on the Sudanese capital. Um, the UN and NGOs, I think the the, the UN NGO aid effort in, in the IDP camps has been remarkably successful. Um, it, I, I, there's been much less of an effort in the rural areas, particularly the rural areas controlled by the rebels. The whole swathes of North Darfur under control, actually the civil administration in many cases of SLA unity, very secure, very safe. No NGOs go there. Somehow the that the old NGO tradition of, of, of working with rebels in war zones and, and, and running a few risks seems to have, have, have vanished, um, which I think is a great shame. Uh, but on the whole, I think they, those on the ground are, are, are doing a, a good job. The troops, um, I, pretty much an irrelevance, really. Um, 
uh, you know, a little bit of patrolling here and there, which is um, which is useful. But the the, the 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 important things that are done by by the troops are, or, or by the Unamid presence, are in civil and political affairs. And you know, as we saw with the attack on on on, on Omdurman, you know, there, we have two the two of the largest peacekeeping operations in the world. Between them, more than three billion dollars being spent. Complete, you know, observers. They had absolutely no role. Um, and in fact, they didn't even know what was going on. I mean, um, it was yeah. easier for me to find out what was going on. Because the bridges it, were closed, and they're based in Khartoum. Yeah, yeah. So they had no observers in Omdurman. Yeah, they were watching from their rooftops with binoculars. And I don't think they were allowed on the rooftops even. There was someone on the roof of WFP. Maybe he was hiding behind a satellite dish or something. <laughs> but, yeah. um, should we take a few more? We should have introductions, by the way. Yes, people. sorry. I will stop referring to people as gentlemen and madam and actually take some names. Thank What's you. your name, sir? Uh, Leo Grind from uh, Maristos International, who uh, uh, in the coming months will be opening reproductive health clinics in Sudan. Um, in, in your description of a, uh, I hesitate to work, use the word normalization, but certainly decline in violence, uh, you've omitted uh, a description of what's happened to the sexual violence uh, that uh, have uh, made a lot of headlines in Darfur. So I'd like to ask you to address what's happened there, and in particular, uh, in, in your model of um, describing uh, a, a central government uh, allowing uh, local militias to uh, plunder, uh, you, you may expect a <clears throat> high level of rape, but perhaps not to the extent of a systematic and sustained campaign, it seems, of sexual violence, which surely, if the intention was not urbanization, was surely uh, depopulation of rural areas. Um, so if you could uh, address the uh, issue of sexual violence um, within that uh, model as well. I just, I'd just like to give Alex an opportunity to jump in before we take another I, I, question. I, I, yeah, let me respond to that, because yeah. that's, um, that's a really important question. Um, the, um, the many, what we've seen in, in the war in Sudan is many different forms of sexual violence and exploitation. And um, the, in, in, in the South, it was characteristically abduction um, and, and what was called enslavement. I mean, and, uh, in, in the Nuba Mountains, we actually had the one and only case that is that is documented of the separation of of, of the sexes and a policy of of rape. Um, we also had 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 this was in. What do you mean by separation of the sexes? In in the in, 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 in fifteen years ago, when there was the jihad in the Nuba Mountains, uh, there there was a, a policy of forced relocation of of the Nuba communities, and for a while, for uh, it didn't last very long because it was unsustainable. Um, and they didn't have the apparatus to do it, and there was a, enough of a, an outcry within Sudan against it. Um, they tried to separate men and women into separate camps, and they actually uh, basically provide the women uh, as as uh, domestic labor laborers and, and and sexual partners to 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 military garrisons. No partnership. I'm sorry. No partnership. Um, in 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 the um, there's there's a long there's a long tradition of 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 of, of Sudanese both military slavery and of acquiring um, women in in this way as as commodities and and, and 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 it was and it was a manifestation of that. Uh, though over over time, I mean, particularly when when one's talking about the 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 officers, I mean, they are they are accepted as as wives. I mean, and, and, and many of them actually stay with their with their, their captors and abductors. Um, so, the, the 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 human rights, the divisions that are made by the of 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 rape and 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 so on and sexual exploitation don't precisely fit the sociological categories um, of, of 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 what goes on. And what we saw in Darfur um, was. Um, at several points during the war, most particularly during the, the really active hostilities, 2003, 2004, a lot of reports of very, very widespread rape. And some of them um, 
some incidents dressed up in, in racist ideological garb. Um, and those have got a lot of play. Uh, there's, there's, there's been a qu very interesting, though, very quiet debate amongst the humanitarians about the extent of this. And, and it's not, um, and, and actually, this is a topic that we don't go into in the book, because the, the, the evidence really isn't there. And it's extraordinarily difficult to get evidence on this um, in, in any case. Um, there was a very recent report by Human Rights Watch a couple of months ago on ongoing sexual violence. And they, and, and they report, which confirms what I was hearing on my last trip, that the pattern has really changed. That the, the, currently, the great majority of, of rape and, and, and sexual violence and exploitation is associated with criminality rather than with uh, uh, and, and any uh, ideological or racial agenda of changing the demography of, 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 the, of the country, which fits with the fact that you know, the, the character of the war has changed. And for the most part, the, um, the Arabs, many of the, the groups that wear the, the Janjaweed spearhead of the rebellion 2003-2004 have now made um, agreements with their non non-Arab neighbors, and they're agreements that aren't necessary, which are not the, the agreements of equals, but they are um, nonetheless uh, agreements that have brought a measure of stability. Um, I'm sorry, we, uh, we've only got about 20 minutes left, so how about I grab four and then four? So we take this gentleman here, and that lady there, and then two more from this side, and then I'll take four from this side. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Kevin Hamilton. I'm the Canadian High Commission here in London. Um, you've mentioned several times the, uh, the recent attack on Khartoum on demand capital uh, by Jem. Conventional wisdom suggests that this is uh, something of a new era, that this is uh, Jem attempting to take the fight outside of Darfur and bring it to, to the doorstep of the government. Uh, first of all, is conventional wisdom correct in that case? If it is, in your opinion, is this uh, likely to complicate a piece or hasten it? Thank you. And then there was the Thanks, Sarah and John. I have two, but they're very quick. Um, one is the Save Darfur movement, particularly in the US. Um, do you think that's an energy that could now most usefully be dissipated, or do you think that it could be channeled usefully um, in the future? Um, and the second is that people still seem to be telling sort of, I don't know, maybe, maybe you call them Matthews, but people still seem still to be using Darfur as an example um, of the effect of climate change in sort of seeding conflict. And I wonder if you could comment on that as well. Um, and one more from that side. Christina Gibby from the LSE. I'm wondering what you think the impact of the International Criminal Court has been or what it will be. Okay. Um, the gem attack and a new era. Um, I think it's it, it's hard to say exactly what the um, the impact will be. I think in in the immediate term, it, it's killed off the peace process. Um, I think the peace process, as it existed, is is, is dead because number one, Jem is is interested in regime change rather than, than peace, and actually, the attack was timed in order to to kill off some attempts that, that were being made to um, to bring them together with the government, uh, and the government will not negotiate with Jem until it has restored what it sees as its as its pride and dignity. Uh, a lot depends on relations between Khartoum and Chad, whether um, I think the, for the first time for 19 years, Khartoum is getting a sympathetic hearing in Western capitals, possibly not in Paris, but in others. Um, and, but that sympathy will vanish if it is seen to be actively destabilizing, let alone invading Chad. So a lot depends on whether, on, on where Khartoum draws the line, whether it scares Chad or it actually goes to war in Chad. Uh, in the meantime, domestically within Sudan, it has, um, it has some very interesting impacts. I mean, there is a, a polarizing impact on public opinion, definitely. There's a, a lot of the marginalized, the southerners and the westerners thought, great, the Arabs are now feeling the war. You know, we felt the war in the peripheries, now they're feeling it in the town. Um, I think that's a superficial sentiment which will dissipate very quickly. I think similarly there'll be a, a lot of recruits to gem, but they won't last long because Jen won't be able to handle them. 
Um, Do you think it'll give the government support amongst the Northern Arabs? I think it's given the government a lot of support. And we see Sadiq al-Mahdi, who was already planning to, to join the government, accelerating that, making very strong statements. And it's, it's consolidating that, um, that commitment among, uh, among the Northerners. Um, Salva Kiir reaffirmed his, 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 his commitment and the, and, and, and the government of national unity. And Got a lot of flack for it from the uh, SPLM grassroots. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it, 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 earned, it earned him some political capital in, in, in Khartoum. Now, the SPLM is just completing its convention. Salva Kiir has been re-elected, but there's going to be a lot of political fallout from the, the divisions that have emerged within the SPLM. So um, it's, it, 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 it's shown a lot of the fault lines in, 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 in Sudanese politics. Uh, and and I think accentuated the processes that were already on, on ongoing. I think it's unlikely that Jem will be able to mount another attack um, because I I don't think it will be in a military position to do so. Uh, so yes, it is a, it is a new era, but whether it's fundamentally a new era, time time uh, time will tell. Um, Save Darfur energy. Save Darfur's energy. I think the the uh, a lot of those who 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 um, what what I find quite interesting about the Save Darfur movement is that there are a lot of college students involved, and 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 and, and, and they're very keen to learn, and 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 so they don't swallow simplistic lines. They're actually studying, you know, what what um, what's happening. And uh, a lot of them are, are are getting interested in 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 the wider issue of. You know, genocide prevention, prevention of atrocities, and so on. And I think that's probably where the the energy of the of of the movement is going in 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 the longer term. Um, climate change. Um, there's, uh, I, I think, climate change is being un, unfairly labelled as as uh, as the culprit for um, for um, what's been happening in in Darfur. I think there was certainly an impact of the mid-80s famine on the social fabric, major impact. And uh, that came at the end of a, a very long dry period. But I, the, the overall weather patterns for the whole Sudan Sahelian region show actually remarkable stability over the last 50 years. Um, it's not, um, there was a dry period culminating in that drought, but there's not actually an ongoing drying. So uh, it, I, it would be it would be a stretch to attribute anything to to climate change, and the the, the ICC, um, I think it, the, the ICC impact depends very much on the political context. When the ICC indictments were first announced um, uh, a couple of years ago, there was the possibility that the Sudan government would have sacrificed those individuals. Uh, if it had some confidence that the process of normalization between Khartoum and the rest of the world, especially Washington, was going to proceed. When that didn't happen, when, as Khartoum saw it, the, the Americans kept backtracking on agreements that they'd made, and of course the Americans likewise accused Khartoum of backtracking, and both charges have some substance, and on the whole Khartoum was doing more backtracking, but the US was also doing some. Um, the lack of confidence that, that then existed had a dynamic within the, the, the regime itself whereby those ready to compromise with America, like the Vice President Ali Osman Taha, were marginalized. Those who had took a much harder line, like Nafi Ali Nafi, were given more power. This has been the main political impact of the Save Darfur movement, has been actually within Khartoum to empower the hardliners. And the result of that has been that the um, the the, the prospect of Sudan handing these people over has vanished. So it, 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 um, until such time as that confidence is, 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 is reestablished and, and, and there is a, and the, the government in Khartoum has confidence about where the limits of what the ICC will do lie, then, then it, nothing's going to happen. I mean, that also comes back to the point about the price of loyalty. Mm -hmm. We saw Musa Hilal being made a governmental advisor in the face of widespread international criticism. I mean, the Khartoum government at this moment in time with an absence of a standing army and the Arabs turning yeah. their backs on them just can't afford to be seen to be willing to hand these people over. Exactly. And, 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 and Musa Hilal, I mean, the, the, the specific thing that prompted him was the fear that he would defect to the other side, as you know. He was going to 
Juba to meet with the SPLM. So you know, they wanted to, to, um, to buy him up and, 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 and reward him and also send a signal to the Arabs, we're not going to sell you out. Uh, the last view from this side. The, uh, Ian, the gentleman just there. Ian Rowe, I'm working with the uh, United Nations monitoring the arms embargo in Darfur. Mm. Just a question about the, uh, the peace process. Obviously, there's been a lot of debate about the, the effectiveness of the DPA and the mediators themselves. I'd be interested to know what your opinion is on it now, maybe just in following up on the question from the High Commission. If the peace process is effectively dead at the moment, whether the DPA needs to be uh, redesigned whether the mediators themselves need to be um, either removed, replaced, or whether it needs to be a chief mediator, this kind of thing? I think the, the, the peace process is, is, is pretty much dead. Um, and I think it was being taken for a ride by, by the rebels, frankly. Uh, I, think it's a, a, I think in the absence of, of any alternative, there's no point in getting back to the DPA and saying, let's change this, let's change that. There are things that were clearly could be improved in it, but what would be the impact of improving them if, 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 the, if the rebels are not in a position to take, take them up and the government isn't willing to compromise? So um, where should it go? Uh, I, I, I would say that the priorities should be two. One is uh, some agreement between um, Darfur and Chad, and the other is Actually, three. The, the, the second is, is, is getting the national electoral demo, democratization process back properly on track, because the center of gravity, the political center of gravity in Sudan is not Darfur. It's the north-south issue. And, and, and the associated issue of the elections and, 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 and who will win. And, th and that's where most of the government's domestic energies are going. And, 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 and if that can work, if we can have some form of you know, credible democratization and liberalization, um, then I think that will have a, a huge impact on, on, on Darfur because, in fact, the two-thirds of Darfurians who are in towns and camps can become part of that um, and, and, and will, over time, become, uh, become part of that. Uh, and then the third is, is, is a grassroots piece. Um, and then I think in that context, Yes, there's some major issues, some major deficiencies with the, the Darfur peace agreement, with the, with the political structures it proposes, the, uh, the wealth sharing, the land, um, la land issues, the security issues are now completely out of date. I mean, they refer to a reality that is, is, is no longer exists. Then one might get back to um, giving attention to, to all those issues. But I, I severely doubt whether um, for the next couple of years, any Darfur-focused peace effort is going to go anywhere. Last couple of questions. Hi, my name is Wendy Mepoche. I'm with uh, the LSE, and I uh, plan to be going to, uh, to Darfur shortly. Um, two quick questions. The first one is, I understand you have a, a fairly cooperative relationship with UNAMID, particularly the uh, political affairs uh, and, and uh, division, that, as you had mentioned, um, particularly with information sharing and political analysis, um, it would seem to me that would indicate some level of confidence in the mission and, and um, wanted to know what you thought as, as sort of the prospects for the mission as it exists now as a hybrid force um, to sort of do the best with what they've got and who they've got on the ground. Um, in a recent article you mentioned um, the strengthening protection of civilians in camps. Um, just wondering if you could speak a little bit about that, um, particularly as it relates to, to that mission's interpretation of the use of force um, for protection purposes. Um, the second one, briefly, is in a recent viewpoint, you mentioned, uh, you sort of summarized an article um, saying RIP, R2P, and that, that was a bit worrying to me because the implications, uh, clearly responsibility to protect wasn't a, a sort of a viable framework for Darfur, but the implications of saying something like that lends concern for um, that being a useful framework for serving uh, human security principles in other areas where um, where civilians in crisis, you know, sort of need some sort of framework for coalescing um, um, some consensus, some international consensus on intervention of some sort, and understanding that R2P doesn't have to be military intervention, other things as well. 
Yeah. The, the issue of the responsibility to protect is a very interesting question because in the book you talk about Colin Powell only being willing to call it genocide after he'd taken legal advice that that wouldn't necess necessitate yeah. um, a military intervention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have designed Unimid the way it's been designed, but given that it is there, I think we have to make the best use of it that we can. And I think there's you know, quite a lot that can be done uh, in terms of patrols around refugee camps, um, um, civilian police within refugee camps, uh, political affairs, civil affairs. Uh, and I think the key thing actually is, 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 is community liaison officers actually getting um, you know, small units, which would include uh, military, police, civil and political affairs, out widely distributed so that they can actually gain some confidence of, with the local people, get good information, um, maybe get humanitarian assistance or even basic services out to these areas through their, um, uh, their mediation efforts. I think that you know, the, the best uh, uh, peace support interventions in Sudan have been very um, in light footprint ones, like the Joint Military Commission in the Nuba Mountains, which kept the peace in a situation which was in many ways just as fraught and complex as Darfur, with just um, over more than three years with just two dozen unarmed uh, civilian monitors who were just ready to go out and, and, and do their job. I think you know, these big, heavy peacekeeping operations drag themselves down with their own weight, and, and, and I think that's one of, the, um, one of the problems. I think the, um, the use of force by these troops has to be very, very judicious, very, very limited, otherwise they're going to find themselves in, in, in very deep trouble very, very quickly. Um, the, the, the architects of the responsibility to protect all insist, oh, it's not about intervention, it's about prevention, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, when the rubber hits the road, it's about intervention. That's why Gareth Evans wanted it. You know, that's why people have been pushing it. And the moment um, the, you know, uh, that is realized, there's huge pushback you know, from Sudan, from Burma, from South Africa. I mean, the, the Secretary General wanted a special advisor on the responsibility to protect. The South Africans and others said, no, we're not going to have him on that, you know, that principle. So he's just, Ed Luck is just the special advisor to the Secretary General. There's real pushback because of the way R2P has been presented politically as a tool of intervention, which means NATO. And, and it's unsurprising that, it's, um, that, the, 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 that this is basically killing it. So why call it, um, you know, why call it R2P if really what you're going to be doing is, 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 is prevention? Um, why not actually just get you know, proper, decent professional diplomacy at doing conflict prevention and, and, and other related classic peacekeeping type operations, which um, have, have expanded and have, have, have developed new rules um, and, 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 and procedures anyway. And I should add that the, the um, though this didn't come across very, perhaps very clearly in, 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 in the piece I recorded for the BBC, I mean, the, the operative word in, in RIP is peace, rest in peace. I mean, that's, um, that, that has to be the priority. So you don't hold that much hope for intervention. You, are, you lay, a, lay out a comprehensive framework in this book for for how and why you think the Western powers have failed to bring about peace in Darfur, the way that the Abuja peace talks were pushed through to a deadline that was everybody's but the, the warring parties. I, I'm getting the sense that you think that the only way that Darfur will be resolved is from the ground up, is with a, with a grassroots resolution. Um, grassroots and, and elites. I mean, the, 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 the political elites have to be, you know, have to be Brought into this, and I think that there aren't needs, that many in Darfur. There aren't that many, and 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 and, and they're not terribly well organised. But the the civil Darfurian civil society has got better organised, mm -hmm. and 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 I think as as people begin to realise that they're not going to be saved by anyone but themselves, and the international community is is not going to do a Kosovo-style intervention, and even if it did, it wouldn't work. The, um, this this to me is really a sign of of encouragement that they will ultimately um, sort, it, sort it out. Um, and I think the, you know, to the extent that Sudan in general and Darfur in particular are able to get back together and, and, and survive and, and maybe even prosper as political entities, it will because, be because of, of indigenous Sudanese political traditions. 
uh, rather than blueprints and, and blue helmets from outside. So you think it has to come from within? It has to come from within. Um, sorry, I exercised my right there to steal a question, and we have time for one more. So, uh, the lady at the front. Um, I was just wondering whether... Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Jill Sanigan. Uh, my interest is probably more in the south rather than in dark blue, but I just wondered if the recent fighting in Abia, you think, actually presents a real threat to the CPA, and by implication, the situation in dark I think the situation in IBA is very worrying. Um, I think it, 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 it is containable, um, but the, what it reflects is a level of distrust between the National Congress Party and the SPLM, um, such that there, the, 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 the channels for resolving serious political differences are very, very weak. And the, the, the people who are in the driving seat on, on both sides are those who are preparing for the worst who are the military. And, and, and this, for me, is, is, is very alarming. I think we've lost a lot of time in dealing with the North-South issues when they were easier to deal with. And as the, the deadline of the 2011 referendum gets closer and closer, the international leverage will get less and less, because the parties will be staring each other down, preoccupied with one another. Um, so I think it's, it, it's, it's really quite ominous. And there's an awful lot of diplomatic work that needs to be done um, on, on that topic. I think we've wasted vast amounts of political capital trying to get the Nigerians in Darfur to change their helmets from green to blue. And uh, you know, it's time now to get back to the real issues, which are north-south. Um, that w I have to s oh, can we just yeah. have one last one for the gentleman at the back? Because we haven't taken any from right at the back. Just so I can quickly want to ask, why is there such a gap between the way Darfur is reported on and commentated on here and the reality you're describing? Why do you think there is this big gap? Um, I think it's, it, there are a, a lot of um, uh, public figures, particularly in the, in the US, but also here, who are very vested in a particular narrative politically vested in, 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 in many cases. Um, it's it, 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 nine times out of 10, if on Sudan you write, things are going to go wrong and it's the government's fault, nine times out of 10 you'll be right. And you can very easily make yourself a <laughs> career as a Sudan expert by just saying that over and over again. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's the one time. And the people one, have. Yeah, and some people <laughs> have. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so there is, you know, it, it, it's very easy. And, and Sudan, you know, when the Sudan government answers back, no one believes it, partly because, you know, it, 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 it has such a dreadful record and it lies most of the time. Um, so it, it, its version of events is discounted. Um, and it's, it, and, and, and also I have to say, if, you know, um, if you do go up, stand up, particularly in the U.S., and 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 and, get, and try and present things the way I've tried to present them, you do um, you do get an awful lot of abuse. Um, but, but, but why do you get that abuse? And what's the political narrative that's so strong that you're? Well, one, once the once the narrative of genocide is there, the implication is that if you are questioning. The, the, a, a simple moral narrative, which is that it's genocide, the US cavalry must come to the rescue. Um, anyone who, who questions that is, as it were, an apologist for the Holocaust. And, and it ain't so. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to jump in there. Thank you so much, Alex. I have to say, I've read it, and um, it is a fantastic book. So. Alex is going to stay behind and be signing some copies. But actually, thank you so much for the questions. We've had some really interesting questions. Um, very few statements, which I was very impressed about. Um, and please, thank you so much, Alex. Thank you.